Welcome everybody uh, to the session Understanding Drupal. My name is Mauricio Dinarte. I am from Nicaragua. I am the co Drupal community lead there. And I work for a Boston-based Drupal company called Agari. We have offices in Boston, in Germany, and in Nicaragua. This is an overview of what we're going to, uh, to learn today. The idea is that after attending this session, you will have the basic knowledge to understand how different parts of Drupal interact with each, with each other. But before going into Drupal itself, uh, we're going to take a step back and talk about websites and web pages. So let's say we have a website, um, uic.com.edu, for example. So that is a website. A website is composed by different web pages. Each of those is identified by a URL. So you know, the slash here represents the home page. But uh, let's say this is a company, so I can have an about page, a team page, a services page, an articles page, a contact page, and many, many more. So the website is composed of many different pages, each of which is identified by a URL. Uh, why is it important to understand this first? Because in Drupal, each of these web, page, web pages can be built using something different. So we're going to cover these concepts you know, during the session. But for example, one can be a node, one can be a view, what can be the output of a module. So there are different ways to assemble web pages in Drupal. And that is what we're going to learn today. Uh, in Drupal, the main area is called the content. And the surrounding areas are blocks. We're going to cover each of these in details later. So, but you know, okay, we we use Drupal, but why? Maybe because it is a requirement in our uh, in our organization, or just because it provides so many benefits that we want to take advantage of. What are some of those? Uh, let's see some example first. So, some Drupal websites: the White House is built using Drupal, Weather.com. The Grammys, Web Economic Forum, examiner.com, Naranja Tradicional de Gandia. <laughs> so that, that is a, um, a small um, business in Spain, and they use Drupal for this specific purpose. They sell oranges, tangerines, some mermaids, and lemons. So Drupal can power that too. And Tesla Motors is also used. Uh, it's also built in Drupal. The, the cars themselves do not run on Drupal, but the website <laughs> do. So we're, we're there. And you know, why? Why we use Drupal? For one, it has you know, high security standards. It is not bulletproof, but the point is that there is you know, a lot of people working on them. And actually, there is a team dedicated to, you know, to guarantee the security of Drupal. So if something is discovered, they will you know, try to fix it as soon as possible and you know, put it away for everyone to use. Drupal is also multilingual. You, know, you can have your site in English only, or you can have your site in English, French, Spanish, Hindi, or you, know, you can invent your own languages too. Drupal supports uh, e-commerce, like the example that I show in, of the sale in oranges, tangerines, marmalades, and lemon. Drupal can scale to you know, serve high loads of traffic. So weather.com, is the biggest Drupal site in terms of traffic. That website receives about one billion uh, requests per month. So that is a lot, and that is really Drupal, so it can scale you know, really, really big. Uh, Drupal is also uh, responsive design friendly. So you know, you, each web page will have its own design. But Drupal will provide the tools so you can implement that design in a you know friendly, uh, responsive, friendly way. So you can have you know a view for the mobile, for the tablet, for the desktop, or or huge or uh, a 4K huge monitor. You can have that. And in Drupal, you know you can also have tools for managing multilingual, uh, excuse me, multi multimedia. So your videos, your audio, your images, PDF documents, whatever you want to. To provide, you can manage that with Drupal. Now, 
it is appealing to use Drupal then, but what is it anyways? So there are three concepts that I will cover today. The one that we're going to focus is Drupal as a CMS. And as a CMS, you know, CMS stands for Content Management System. It allows for multiple people to, inter uh, to participate in the creation of content. So let's say we all work for the same organization. Each of us you know, can be part of a, a specific section or department of that organization, and we can be creating content for that specific section. Uh, it is also possible to establish publication workflows. So in, let's imagine that we have a newspaper website. So we have the journalist who writes the article, but it is not published by default. It has to go through a process. Then we have a, an editor. So the editor, he doesn't have the permission to create new articles, but he can review articles created by other people. So he, uh, that person will have the permission to you know, proofread, make changes, make suggestions. And that person, uh, he cannot create new articles. He can only review. But when, the, when that person says, OK, this is ready for publication, he will pass that for, let's say, a department officer. or, or And this uh, last person is the one that he might not be, be allowed to do any change, but only change the publication status so it goes live, it goes to the website. So in Drupal, you can, you can have not only multiple people participate, participating in the creation process, but also each of those people can have like a specific uh, permissions of things that they can do and things that they cannot do. Uh, Drupal also supports content revisioning, and that is keeping track of changes. So for example, let's say that something wrong appeared in the website. You can roll back to a previous revision, and you know that's it. So for one, you can, you know, it, it is kind of accountable, so Drupal will keep track of who did the change, what change was exactly, you know, what words were changed, what images were changed, Drupal will keep track of that, and also the date, date and time. And it will, you know, you can configure it to keep track of every single change that you make to every piece of content. So if anything goes wrong, you can roll back to the previous version, and you will know who did the change and when. And also Drupal can uh, provide granular access control over each piece of information. Imagine that, uh, you know, in the in the e-commerce website that, that I showed, like the real simple one, we have a price for, for the general public. But we also have some frequent customers, and we want to give a special deal for them. So we can configure the price to be different for those frequent customers. Everything on the sign will be the same, everything. but that price field. So, you know, Drupal allows that granularity that you can, you know, expose or hide, you know, piece by piece or complete section of the website. And all of that is it's out of the box. This is the Drupal as a CMS role. Drupal is also a framework and everyone that was in the keynote today, you know, they talk about this a little bit. So, through uh, using custom code, it is possible to extend Drupal beyond its pre-built functionality. So by default, Drupal does, you know, doesn't uh, serve as an e-commerce e platform, but you can uh, add some modules and you will have an e-commerce platform with Drupal. Or you can use it as a backend of a mobile, mobile application. Then Drupal is a community. So we are over 200 countries countries participating in the community, over 150 languages, over 3,000 code contributors, and over 95,000 Arctic users. So, you know, we are big. And before going any further, slides are available. Uh, if you go to the session page, um, there is a link so you can have the slides. And if you came in a little bit uh, later, late, uh, you can interrupt me anytime if you have any questions. <laughs> so this is the fun part. This is where we have to pay attention. And here we go, basic concepts. So core, what is Drupal core? Drupal core is the minimum piece of software required uh, to start a Drupal project. If you don't have core, that is not Drupal. 
It can be WordPress, it can be Joomla, it can be Django, something else. But if you don't have Core, it is not a Drupal project. Core, among other things, contains modules and themes. We're going to cover that later. And as I said before, Core serves, serves as, a as a framework to build on top of. Then we have modules and themes. What is the purpose of each of these? So modules add functionality, and themes control appearance. Let's say, for example, that you, you, know, you have a blog, and every time that you write an article, you want a tweet to be sent, or you want a, post, a Facebook post to be, you know, to be sent to Facebook. So that is functionality, and functionality is provided by modules. Let's say that you want to change the color scheme of your website, or the font's letter or font type. That is appearance. So appearance is controlled by the theme. So modules add functionality, themes control appearance. Then we have the contrib repository. So what is that? It is community contributed modules and theme. If we go up a little bit of slides back, you know we have thousands of contributors to Drupal. So it is you, it is me. Anyone can contribute to Drupal, and they put you know their modules or themes available for the world to use. And again, this extends Drupal beyond its pre-built functionality. Content. So, uh, as I said before, we are going to focus on the content management side of Drupal, and for content, this is the most important concept. No uh, word that you will see. Note. What is a note? A note is a piece of information that can tell a story by itself. For example, if we have a car, we can describe the car. How? We can say the color, the make, the model, the year. We can have like the plate, the, the car plate. We can say how many windows it has, how many doors it has, what type of fuel it uses. So the, the note uh, is a container of information used to describe something. So in, in this example, the card. In Drupal, uh, a note can be used to, to store information about physical things like a car or non-physical things like an, an article. So this, in a, this is an article. Uh, with a couple of things that every note has. Every note has a title. Every note has an author. Every note has a date and time of publication. Every note has a URL. And actually, every note has an internal numeric identifier. It is called need or note ID. So your, your first note that you created on the side is node one, and it will go you know, incrementing by one. The second one will be node two, node three, and so on. Internally, let's say this is node one. You can access this page in Drupal by typing your domain slash node slash one. But you know, let's say, oh, you know, I wrote a very good article. Go to mysite.com slash node slash 345. You know, people do not remember numbers. They remember like sentences or phrases. So every node also have a URL alias. So instead of remembering node 345, you remember, okay, you go to slash blog slash altering views results. So, you know, this is more user friendly and this will also uh, help in your SEO. Nodes also can have fields. We're going to cover this later. Uh, nodes can also have a publication status. As I said before, you can like, Create a note, but maybe it's not ready. Maybe you don't, you don't have you know the complete story that you you want to tell. So you save it as a draft, and it will not be published by default. Uh, only administrator for the site will be able to go to that note again and edit and then publish it. Uh, so you know those are some basic properties of every node. Well. We already described cars, but can we have more wheels? Mm -hmm. Yes, let's imagine that we are we sell monocycles, uh, monocycles, three cycles, cars, and bikes. So when we have different objects or different ideas, we have to make 
groupings of them. And those groupings are called content types. So a content type is an abstraction that allows to group nodes that share similar characteristics or describe the same idea. For example, it doesn't make sense for a motorcycle to say how many windows it has. Motorcycles don't have any window, but cars do. As far as I know, motorcycles cannot go in reverse. So there are specific stuff about each type of content that are unique you know, to the group that they belong to. Um, so we, you know, in Drupal, those groupings are the content types. And they serve as a template to collect information. As I said before, uh, you know, we will have a form in Drupal, and in that form for cars, we are going to ask for make, model, year, color, etc. Uh, for bikes, we can we can ask for you know if it, how many miles per hour can it make, or you know different kind of stuff for for this will be different, for that will be different. For you know non-physical things, we can have an article content type to store information about a news article. We can have uh, if we are in a university, a course article to have information about a course. If we are, you know, a band writer or something like that, we can have a content type for events when we store information about the events, like the date, the venue, uh, you know, the. Um, is there a content type that would not be considered a node? Like, say you have a form and you have another page with content on it. Um, which one's the node? So is the page with content on it the node, or is the form just like another node or part of it? Can you explain that a little bit? Sure, so that is a good question. The question is, what? Uh, paraphrasing, what is the relationship between nodes and content types? And if I can have a form that is not a node, right? Right. So, okay, the key part here is content types are templates. So when you create a node, you create a node of a specific type. So you create a node of type event. You create a node of type car. Every node is of one type. So it's a, you know, you cannot have a node without a type. Uh, the node will also, will always be part, or will also, yeah, will always be part of a type. Like, when in the in the beginning of the session that I mentioned that when you are assembling a page, you can have a node or you can have something else. There are other things that can produce a page. For example, you can produce a form using a module. Right. For example, you can in, there is a mo a module called contact in Drupal Core, so people can send you you know a message via contact form. Mm -hmm. That is not a node. Okay. That is a form that was created okay. by a module. Uh, okay. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank so, you. So yeah. So if, if you are creating a node, it will always be of like, one of the content types available. So it's either like a basic page or yeah. an article. Yeah. Or, okay. You yeah. might be talking about blocks too. Like you can have a little form block or something you create that's custom that you could then plug in so to a content type or whatever, and then that would that would then show up on every. Yeah. So. Right. So once you get the blocks, I think you'll probably like. Yeah. It. Uh, we're going to cover blocks later, okay. but uh, the idea is similar. And actually, we, we're going to see that blocks also have block types, okay. but you know that's coming okay. later. Sorry. No, that's a fine. I, I have one other question. Are all the concepts that you're going to review today um, incorporated in? Are they version um, agnostic, like? Yes. Six, seven, eight. So the question is if all the concepts that we're going to cover today are version agnostic, and the answer is yes. This applies for Drupal 6, 7, 8, and hopefully 9. So the idea is you know, to have the basic knowledge, to assemble a, a, a page, a web page. And you know, in Drupal, as versions come out, we usually add stuff. Do not, we do not remove the previous one. We build on top of what we already have. So, you know, this will work for any version that you're working now and in a couple of years. And going back, content types uh, collect information and this uh, is the management of that information. So, how? Let's imagine that, you know, we, uh, 
we we sell cars, we sell motorcycles, we sell bicycles. In our website, we also have events. We also write news articles and so many different types of content. But you know, we can have let's say two hundred or two thousand different nodes. Each of node, each node will be on a, of a certain type. But then, you know, someone comes to our website and they are only interested in cars. They don't care about motorcycles. They don't care about all events. They only care about cars. So, in Drupal, we can we can say, "Hey, Drupal, show me all the cars. Show me all the nodes of the content type cars." So, for one, content types is like your first like way to separate content from one type of, of the other. So, you know, hey, we, we have here all the cars, but we may want to go beyond, like we, 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 want, we can have, I want all the red cars, or I want all the SUVs, or I want all the Toyotas that were built in 2010 onwards. So content types do not suffice. They are like the, the first step to separating content but they do not suffice. So what is next? We have fields. So fields are used to, to structure the information that is being stored. In other words, you know, they say discrete piece of data that can be used for displaying, filtering, sorting. For example, who here have used Facebook before? Some of us have used Facebook. So in Facebook, we have a blank box where we can type anything that we want. We can, you know, write a poem if we want. Some we can add pictures, add videos, and so on. Unless we are Facebook or Google, it is really, really hard to find information if you put all that information in one box. It is really, really complicated. So. How do we work around that? We have fields. For example, let's say we, you know, in, in the car example that we're given, I want to look for all the cars that are red. Then I will create a new field that will store the information about color and nothing else but colors. I, w I will have another field to store information about year, another one for make, another one for model, and so on. So. Having these fields, having this information stored in discrete ways will help me uh, to be able, in the future, to do all these things. For example, display. I can collect, you know, let's say for a car, 10 different pieces of information. But when showing to the user, maybe I only want to show four out of 10. So I can, per field, define what is going to be presented. Also, the information that I have in fields, I can say, okay, I want all the red cars, I want all the Toyotas, I want everything that was built 2010 onwards. So fields is the way in Drupal to be able to, okay, have this information in a, in a way that Drupal will be able to do these operations later. And also I can apply sorting. Let's say I, I want to sort it by year descending or, or, or any other, uh, like criteria that I define. So fields uh, are used for that purpose. Also, this is uh, important. With fields, it is possible to enter the information in different ways and output the information in different ways. An example of this. So we are collecting data in Drupal. And we want to store information about a place, so, so a, a physical place on, on, on the earth. So let's say we can put the name and use a service like Google to, G, to, you know, to translate that stream to a point on earth. Or I can enter the information as latitude and longitude. Or I can actually display a map to the user and they can click on the map and that's how I identify you know, the place. Or there are some uh, files, you know, as we have PDF or Word or whatever. Uh, there are some files specifically used to store geographical information. One of them is KML. So I can put like an upload button and someone will upload a KML file and I will have the information about that specific place on Earth. So 
this doesn't exist in Drupal. Like, the, uh, you can have various modules that will provide each of these one, but there is not a single module that provides all of them. But in theory, it's possible. You can collect the same information in different ways. And no matter how you collected this information, you can also present it in different ways. Let's say the user click on a map, but then you show latitude and longitude. So you can collect the information in one or more ways and present it in one or more ways. And actually, when presenting, in, and this is a strength of Drupal, you can aggregate that information. So let's say, uh, you know, you show a, a world map and you show all the events happening on that map. So for you to know, this is Drupal, uh, a website building Drupal that shows like inf events that are happening or are going to happen across the world. So maybe you want to have a look at it. But the point is that you collect the information and then you can aggregate it and present it in different ways. Some example field types. So that this was also mentioned in today's keynote. And in Drupal, we can have different type of fields. Each type of field will store different type of information. So for one, we can have text fields. This is a regular text field, one line. We can have multi-line text field, so to store multiple lines. We can have number fields. So here, it says established in 26. This is actually a number field with a prefix. So this is also really, really important about fields. So when you create a new field, you have to decide what type of information it's, it is going to store. Why? Because Drupal will validate that piece of information that you're giving. For example, if I say that this is going to be a number field, someone cannot type hello world because that is not a number. So if you define something as a number field, Drupal will make sure that you enter a real number. If you say you can only enter integers number, you cannot add like 13.5 because that is a decimal number. Drupal will make that validation for you. If you say, I only want to show uh, years uh, or positive numbers, you cannot enter minus five because that is a negative number. If you are a story, let's say, <coughs> uh, like in this case, year, you want to prepend or uh, append some text around that. So in this case, it is established in 26, 26 2006. So Drup uh, Drupal using fields allow you, you know, to store the information, to use it for the different purpose that I already mentioned, but it will also make sure to apply the validation criteria that you define. Some examples of prepend and, uh, and suffix that you can add is like, if you have an online store and here in the United States, and you are completely sure that you only use US dollars for selling, then why give the user the opportunity to write something else? If you only sell in US dollars, you only put like a number that will allow for decimal values and automatically prepend USD or the, you know, symbol, the dollar symbol. So, you know, that, that way you are presenting information in, in a same way. There is some validation already in place. So we have text field, multi-line text field, numbers, we have images, we have URLs, we have emails. You know, again, it will make a validation. If, if you try to type something that doesn't have an at sign, it will throw an error. And the people that you know the user will not be able to save that note because there is some validation error. Uh, it can store phone numbers. This is called taxonomies. We're going to cover that later. And you can also have dates and times. And this is only a subset. You can have a lot of fields and more modules which add functionality, more modules can add new field types. So for example, uh, a model can define a field type to store geographic information. Any questions so far? Okay. So again, uh, a little bit of a recap. This is the basic. So we're assembling a web page here, 
And this, which is like the main part, would be the node. The node is of a certain type, and that type, you know, is a template that defines one or more fields. So let's say we have this node with a title, it has an image field, it has some uh, like tagline, and then the main description. But what, what's up with all of the surrounding stuff? In Drupal, these are called blocks. So what is a block? A block is a container of extra information to display along the main content of your website. Blocks are placed in a theme region. So a little detour here, Drupal core, well, Drupal core chips with uh, a, a theme called Bartik, which is this blue kind of shade that we have by default. You can add more themes, but by default we have Bartik and this is, this is the blue one. So each theme, will define something that is called theme regions. So a theme region is somewhere in the theme when you can place blocks, as simple as that. So you can have a block in the left sidebar, in the right sidebar, in the footer, in the header, and so on. So where you can place blocks will depend on the theme. Every theme will define its own region. So this, in, this is an example for Bartik, but if you if you install a different theme, that theme will define its own regions. And if you know, if you want to know which regions you have, you have available, you go to a structure, block layouts, and there will be a link that says demonstrate block regions. And when you click on that, you come to a page like this. A couple of things about uh, regions. Some of them are collapsible. What does that mean? Let's say that we have the main content and we have a right sidebar, but we don't have a left sidebar. And you know, we don't want to have a blank space here. So what Drupal will do, and actually what the theme will do, because it is the theme's responsibility to control appearance, this region will be collapsed. So the main content will take up that space. If we don't have like either left or, side, left or right sidebar, the content region will expand to occupy the full width of the page. It, it is not very clear in the, in, the, in the screen, but this highlighted section, it, it is actually with, with a gray background. If, not, if you don't place a block in that section, the whole thing will collapse and it won't be presented. You will go from blue to white directly without the, the gray thing in the middle. Not all the regions collapse out of the box, that will depend on the theme. But you know, the theme will also, like, will try to, to make sense. Like, for this kind of stuff, it will do it automatically. And this is controlled by the theme. So you have a theme that defines one or more theme regions. And if those theme regions, you place your blocks. Talking a little bit more blocks, blocks can display a static or dynamic content. So a static content is something that it is the same or almost the same like every time. For example, a copyright text, uh, we can have something copyright 2016. So that will change once a year. So that is in nature a static, that the content doesn't change often. Or if you have like in Neatcamp, we have a uh, sponsor, so we want to show a banner of that sponsor. I want to show that on every page. Then we can have a, a static block displaying that content in every single page of the website. Blocks can also display dynamic content. This is content that in nature like change regularly. For example, if you have a blog and you are like writing a new article every day, you can have like a, a blog that says recent articles and you show that the five most recent articles. If you put an article every day, that thing will be changing every day. Or if you have a store and you want to, you know, have a, a blog listing the latest products that come to the store. If you add products like every week, that will be changing every week. So depending on the nature of how often things change, blogs can be either static or dynamic. Blogs can also enforce visibility rules. So this. This is where we start to reuse or recycle the concepts that we have learned so far. So for example, you can say that a blog is only visible 
when when you're viewing a node of a certain content type. To put an example, uh, if we have a, a blog section in, in our website, and we can we want to show like more articles by the same author, so it doesn't make any sense to have more articles by the same author in the event content type, because events don't write articles. You know, we only have we, we have an article content type, and we want to show more articles by the same author only when we're in that section of the website. So we can say blogs. You will only you will only be available if you are of type article or basic page or any of the others that might exist. We can also enforce visibility rules based on language. Like this blog will only be available in the English version of my website or in the Spanish web uh, version of my website based on pages, this is like like I said before, only on the home page, only on the contact page, only on the services page, only on the article pages. So we can defi define that. And we can also define visibility rules in uh, using rows. We're going to cover that later. And again, Drupal can, can be extended so new modules can uh, like integrate new logic to the visibility rules. Blocks can also be aware of its environment. So a block can use data that you know from the node or the page that they are displaying to to you know to change the data that it will display. For example, if we are going to show more articles by the same author, then the blog will say, okay, this I am in, in this node. This node is of type article. And this node was created by Mauricio. So I'm going to load more articles created by Mauricio. So it will, you know, get information from its environment to to fetch into the blog and change its content. If then you go to an article written by Juan, then that will change to article written by Juan. And you know, depending on the environment, the content will change. You know, an example: more articles from the same author, or or if you're selling uh, cars more vehicles on the same, or sell in the same city. And blocks can also have fields. You know, in the same way that content types can have fields, blocks can also have fields. And in the same way that there are uh, content types, we can also have block types. So we can have, in theory, uh, a block type called a special offer with the following fields, title, description, image, and expiration date. And we can show that blog in the website, like on every page, as long as the expiration date hasn't like happened. And you know, that, that is a blog. And we can have that in, in the sidebar if we want, for example. Questions so far? Okay. Hopefully I'm I'm doing a good job. Otherwise I will be worried. Okay, views. <laughs> so this is a uh, really big stuff, and we can talk about views the whole day. There are some sessions only about views, but this is the one slide summary of views. So views is a list, uh, is a listing of information. You can use a views to list notes, users, comment, taxonomy terms, files, and many more things. We're going to cover some of these in the session. So what is the job of views? Views scans your website using any criteria you specify. And when I say any criteria, it is based on the fields that you define. So views will use the fields that you defined before to be able to you know, search for a specific information, filter information that you don't want, define an or a sorting criteria, and so on. And once you know all the pieces of information that you want to present are collected, then you can present it in different ways. So for example, we can have an HTML table or an RSS feed that is XML, or we can create a PDF document, or we can create a C CSV document or an Excel document, or we can have an interactive map as the one that I showed before, or we can have a mid image slideshow, or we can have a JSON representation to be used in a REST endpoint. So what is the idea? You have the information in your website, you use a view to say, I want to display this information. And then you can display that information in different formats. You can have 
like the table, but also like a, 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 a link to download a PDF or download a, an Excel file or download a CSV file or something else. So you can, the same information can be presented in different ways using views. And a real life, real life example, so we have cars. So this is a view. Uh, I am showing the plate, the year, the uh, make, uh, yeah, make, uh, the manufacturer, and the model, the image, the color, the type of transmission, and the type of fuel that every car uses. So, you know, one thing that views can do is they can paginate results. That is, if we have, let's say, 25 uh, cars in my web page but I only want to show five at a time. So it will show the five, and down below it will have some numbers to go to the next five, to the next five, and so on. So with views, you can, instead of showing everything at once, you can break the information into pieces and go page by page. Also, as I said before, uh, you know, you can sh show the information in different ways. So here I have a, a view that shows a table of five elements, and here I, sh I have a view of only one element. When I, uh, before I said that views is used to make listing of content. When we say listing, usually we think on two or more things, like, you know, does it make any sense to have a list of, of only one element? The answer is yes, sometimes it makes sense. For example, views has an option to define something like random. I want to show a node randomly. So for example, uh, in, in this case, I have a view where I show a car, only one element randomly. Every time that you change the page, that you reload the page, this will change. This will remain the same, but this will change. So you can have random stuff using views. Where do you define the view? Is it, uh, is it in a block where you, um so, our, so those are two views. You have the, the view in the bottom half of the screen where it's the five cars, and then the top half is another view. Mm -hmm. Where in the admin would you like say, like, I want this view to look like this, I want this view to look like that? Okay, so the question is, where do I define the views? So you go to a structure and views. All the things that we've covered so far, like content types, blog blogs, and views, you go to a structure and there will be a section specific for those things. Okay. But in the view itself, when you are creating the view, remember that I say you can present the information in different ways. Uh -huh. So you can say, okay, I am creating a view, but I want to display the same information in different formats. Okay. So you can configure your view to be a page uh -huh. or to be a block uh -huh. or to be something else. So you, you will have the options. When you go to the administration page, mm -hmm. you will be prompted. Do you want to create a page, a blog, or mm -hmm. other options? Mm -hmm. okay. So is a view considered a content type then? So the question is, can a, a view is a content type? No, view is not a content okay. type. Views can use content types to define what information you want to present. For example, this view uh, was configured to display content only of type car. But view itself, the view itself is not a content type. And one extra thing with views, you know, you can define your sorting, your uh, filtering criteria, but you might also want to expose some of that uh, flexibility to the visitor of your website. For example, you can expose how do you want to sort. For example, it says year. You can, the user that visits your website can say, I want to sort ascending or descending based on the year, or I want to search only uh, if the make is Toyota, or if the make is Tesla, or if the make is Mercedes, or if the model is this, or if the model is that, or the year. So you can have like a predefined set, but then allow the user to change that. This is called views exposed filters. So as I said before, we can talk about views the whole day, but just to give you the different concepts, uh, you define what kind of information you want based on the fields. You can also define sorting criteria. You can define the view to be a page, a blog, or something else. 
Uh, and in addition to the default stuff that you provide, you can expose filters so the end user, the visitor of your website, can you know can go beyond what you already did, like change the filtering, change the ordering, and so on. Now, why so much theory? Like this is a lot already. Well, <laughs> in Drupal, we love Nest. We love nesting markup. So, for example, if we want to show some text, we have this so much markup. In Drupal, we also like nesting arrays. <coughs> so, this is for themers. This is for uh, excuse me. This is yeah. This is for themers. This is for backend developers, and this is for us. So, Drupal likes to nest concepts. So, how? Like this. Remember that more authors by the same article block that I said before? So, you start like on the outer side, on, on the outermost piece. You have a theme which defines a theme region. In that theme region, you, def you place a block. That block was configured to be created using a view. That view is a listing of nodes, and you are showing specific fields of that node. So that is how Drupal, you know, encapsulates one concept over over another, over another, and that is how you assemble your web page in Drupal. So, you know, for a single use case, we have five different concepts. But, you know, this can be something different. For example, you can have a theme region that has a blog, but that blog was provided by a module, not through a view. Or you can have a view, not of user, but of not of nodes, but of user of your website. So you mix and match the different concepts to assemble your website. And all of this is only for one piece, let's say this piece right here. So you will reuse those same ideas and same concepts for this, 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 and so on. So in Drupal, you have to understand a couple of things and how they interact with each other before you know understanding how the system works you know, in the big picture. Any questions so far? Okay, so we're going to uh, go faster now because we understand Drupal now. So what is a user? A user is a visitor to your website, so depending on who's visiting, you can show or hide entire section of your website, a specific fields, or you know, whatever you want. So Drupal, can handle multiple users, which may uh, sharing credentials unnecessary. So let's say we all work for the same organization. If we all have the same username and password, then if something happens, how can we tell, oh, it was Mauricio and not Juan who did the mistake? So in Drupal, you don't need to do this. You don't need to share username and password, you don't need to share credentials. Each person can have its own you know, credentials. If that person leaves the company or leaves the organization, you can block that user so that user cannot make any other change in the website. You can decide when you block the user um, <coughs> to also delete it. And when you delete it, you can remove all every content that they created. So that is up to you. Drupal will give you options. But in general, a user is a visitor of your website. An example, users have a, a, a username, they can have a picture, they can have a fields to have a description. Uh, as notes, they have an internal identifier called UID, uh, which is a, also a number, so user one, user two, user three, and so on. Because that is not intuitive, you can also have your aliases Drupal also can have, uh, for users, a language preferences. So if, if you have your website in English and Spanish, and you, you know, the user is from Nicaragua, like I am, do, like, like, like I am, I want my website to be presented in Spanish. So Drupal will respect that setting in the user. Also, the users can have like time zones. Let's say we, we have a website about events. And you know it is events in US, in the US, in Europe, in Asia, and so on. So you will have different time zones, and we have a calendar where we show everything. So Drupal will translate 
when you create that event, you you say this event is at 11 a.m. Eastern time, and when someone visits the calendar page, Drupal will look for the uh, time zone setting for that user and change all the calendar to be displayed in the local time of that user. So user can have also uh, time zones and languages. Then, how does the permission system work in Drupal? It is something like this. We have a role. A role is a collection of permissions. And our roles are used to assign privileges to a group of users. For example, uh, you can have like in, in the workflow that I described before, the journalist who does write the article, the editor who make changes, and the uh, department chief who publish the article. So you can have different types of user, and that can be even maps of your organization hierarchy if you want. By default, Drupal chief with three uh, rows. One is anonymous user, one is anonymous user that uh, is any visitor to your website, authenticated user are those that have username and password, administrators who can do everything, and you can define your own, like a content editor or something else. You can define your own roles. So the role is a collection of, of permissions. What is a permission? A permission is a check if a user can perform a specific action. For example, this user can create content of type article. This user can revert revisions for the content type article. This uh, user can post comments. These users can, <coughs> users can use the site-wide contact form, and so on. In Drupal, there are a lot of permissions to, to be very granular to the things that you grant access to. And how does it all work together? Let's say I want Mauricio to be able to create articles. So it works like this. First, you have the permissions. So the role will be a collection of those permissions. And you assign the role to Mauricio. And you, Mauricio can be like, let's say, a content manager. And Mauricio can also be an administrator. And Mauricio can also be, let's say, a sales representative. So in the end, Mauricio will have all the permissions that are granted by all the different roles. So these things stack up. So a role can have some permission. A different role can have other permissions. But in the end, the user will have the collection of all of the of the of the roles that it that were defined. So uh, one user can have several different kinds of roles assigned to them. Yes, oh. yes. And for example, if let's say we have this map to uh, departments in, in our website, we have uh, sales, marketing, and finance. So Mauricio today can be sales and finance, and they can do some stuff. But then he's moved to marketing. So we remove the, the role of sales and finance and assign the role of marketing, and the permission set will completely change. So it is very flexible. You can add, remove as you need. You can create, you know, everything. Menus. So menus are a collection of links used to navigate your website. Uh, for example, this. You can have a very simple menu like like this, home, services, blog, about, or contact, or you can have very complex menus that are hierarchical. That is, um, a menu can have sub-menus. For example, here, uh, I have this main menu, and when I click on this, I get this sub-menu, and I can get crazy and put videos and things and stuff. So menus are links to navigate the website. By default, Drupal has the main menu here, but you, it, 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 it comes with five or so menus, and you can add more as needed. Taxonomies, this is a scary word sometimes, but it is used for categorization. So uh, you can use it to collect, relate, and classify content. The taxonomy system, it's only two words. You need to only learn two words, vocabulary and term. So a vocabulary, is a group of terms, as simple as that. Let's see some examples. If we want to store information about, about fruits, we have a vocabulary, which is only the name, and we can have terms for apple, grapes, oranges, pineapple, strawberry, bananas, and so on. As you can infer, infer uh, 
tax, uh, taxonomy terms can also have fields. So in addition to have you know the, the name, you can also have a picture, or you can have any field that can you can you can use in Drupal. You can also have for taxonomy terms. So the the vocabulary is the like the group, the wrapper, the collection, and then you have the different terms. You can get crazy and have hierarchies. So this is. I cannot pronounce this, but <laughs> it's like the how we ta categorize living organisms. So we are animals and chordata and mammalia, and deep down there we are humans. So you can have with taxonomies hierarchies hierarchies of of things. Some uses. So you can. Uh, for example, by default, this is Drupal core. You don't have to do anything special. If you have, if you tag a piece of content like a node with a, a tag that says Drupal, so you, if you, that will be a link. And when you click on the link, Drupal will list all the nodes that were tagged with that specific book taxonomy term. You can also use this, you know, to show to have a blog, and in that blog show more articles or more notes that have the same tag, so to show related content. You can also have a, a, a taxonomy that, you know, is, is your organization hierarchy, and then as a, a user will have a taxonomy term assigned to them, and based on that taxonomy term, they will have, have access to this piece, part of the website, to that part of the website, and so on. And you can get crazy and add fields to taxonomy terms. For example, you can have a taxonomy term with the states, the name of the states, but you can have a field to, to restore a geographical information of that state, and then you show a map, and you show like, okay, like um, now with the elections, uh, in uh, Arizona, we have so many people voting, and uh, in Arkansas, we have so many people voting, and you will get a map, with like a pin and the number of people that voted in that state. And that is, you know, Drupal's magic. Like you have a taxonomy, that taxonomy has some geographical information, you display that on a map, and you can make a count of every node that was tagged with that taxonomy and put it in a bubble. Simple as that. Again, we study so many different concepts because Drupal loves nesting. And, you know, we can uh, have users Taxonomy terms, for example, we can have a view that lists taxonomy terms, and those taxonomy terms can have fields. Or we can have a view that shows users, or so on. You, you get the idea. Uh, any questions so far? We're almost done. I just have some FAQ that to tell you the truth. I invented myself, but bear with me. <laughs> so, today we talk about this. <laughs> Every time you have core, God kills a kitten. Please think of the kitten. So, why is hacking core? In another word, is it a good idea to change the downloaded code to make a very quick fix? It's a one line fix. No, never, ever, ever do that. It is a bad idea. Why? For at least three reasons. When you are making an update of, of your website, and you know, they come regularly, like once a month, the new code will overwrite your changes. So if you make one little tweak, you will have to do to, to do that same little tweak the next time you update. Uh, and if you make 10 little tweaks, then 10 changes. If you did 100, 100. If you forget, this will break. And it's not good that things break. So uh, do not have core. Hacking core means modifying the, the, the files that you downloaded. Do not do that. Another reason is that Drupal is a framework. You can alter, even if you don't want or you don't know, how the framework, framework works. For example, we talk about validation. Maybe the change that you did modify the validations process so uh, people can enter invalid or incorrect data. So do not, and if you don't know what you're doing, that can happen. And what, what do you do instead? So you, you use the framework API. So in Drupal, uh, one simple way, we also mentioned this in the, in the keynote, we have hooks. Hooks is like 
during the page rendering process, Drupal will make several stuff like in, in a train. Okay, we come to this station. Who want to do anything here? And we saw the picture, the models raise their hands, and they say, okay, I want to interact with Drupal. They get some information, they made it changes, and you know, the next model can do something, the next model can do something. How do you implement a hook? Uh, you have a hook name, like hook not preset. You have a name of your module, which in this case is Nicaragua. What you basically do is, you change the word hook by the, change of, by the name of your module, and that's it. And you have the signature of, of, of the hook itself. What is cron? Cron is a system that runs like on certain intervals of time to do some expensive operation. For example, searching requires to have an index. An index is like, okay, Drupal, I know that all these nodes exist. That is called an index in Drupal, and that index is created on cron. So you say, run this every hour. So every hour, Drupal will go through your website and update the index so people can search your website. Some examples, you know, indexing uh, content. You can also schedule tasks such as sending email. You can send an email every day at 8 a.m. You can do that using Chrome. You can remove temporary files or catch or invalidate cache. This is a little bit more abstract. Entities, so we have notes. We have content types, and then we have entities. So uh, the node, uh, actually, this is a better explanation. So we have entities, we have content entities, and configuration entities. So node, user, taxonomy terms, comments, views, all of these are entities. The reason why we can attach no a fields both to nodes and users, or also to terms and comments, and so on, it's because these are entities, and entities are fieldable. Not all of them, some of, like, files is not fieldable by default, but uh, like notes, user comments, and terms, you can attach fields, and everything that I describe about fields, that is provided by entities. Uh, configuration by the state, configuration is something that you want to, you know, uh, when developing a website, you have a development environment, and a staging environment, and a production environment, Anything that will move through those environments is called configuration. Everything that is, it is only relevant to this specific environment is called a state. So for example, the last time that cron run, that is only relevant to, to the current website. Or for example, Drupal has a feature to put your website in maintenance mode. When, when Drupal is in maintenance mode, only administrators can access it. Maybe you're making an update or something else. So, when I put like the live website, the production website in maintenance mode, that doesn't change my staging environment or that doesn't change my development environment. So that is a state. A state is only relevant to the specific environment. So that is configuration versus the state. And please get involved with the community. Uh, uh, we want to help in any way we can. This is a photo from DrupalCon a couple of years ago. Please, please, please provide feedback. You can ping me at DinarCon. I am DinarCon everywhere in the internet or send me an email, mauriciodagalit.com. And thank you. I hope it was, this was really useful. And let's build some Drupal sites.